worship the Lord, lament before the Lord, pour out before the Lord. Whatever it is you need to do today, you're welcome to do it here. This is an open space for us. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for being here among us. We thank you for dwelling among us. We don't deserve it, yet here you are. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you for everything, Lord. And we are ready to worship you this morning, God. Ready.
to your way. Hallelujah. Good morning, Restoration Church. It's wonderful to be in the house of the Lord this morning where we can trade in our sorrows for joy and strength and peace. Hallelujah. So as we worship God this morning, stand in your victory. Your praise is your weapon. Amen. Whatever that looks like for you, you can come on to the front. You can be standing your feet on your feet, but we're here to worship the most high God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. of expectancy as in I have this burden I have this chain that it feels like it's weighing me down but I know what the word says and I'm gonna worship until I see it on the ground and I'm gonna dance because I know it's already there so as we sing this song we're gonna start from the top thank him for what he has done and thank him for what he will do because you will see the goodness of God in your life so praise him praise him you throw a party in the presence of my enemies. You invite me to the table and you tell me just to sit and feast. And you are not afraid when the terror's screaming loud at me. Hear it, cause you have overcome and you're the God of victory. Dancing on the grave that once held me bound. I'm dancing on the chains that are laying on the ground. I'm dancing out the dark. I'm lighting up the night. Your joy becomes a weapon, and I am here to fight. I'm dancing on the grave that once held me bound. I'm dancing on the chains that are laying on the ground. I'm dancing out the dark. I'm lighting up the night. Your joy becomes a weapon, and I am here to fight. Lord, thank you, Lord. When I walk through the valley, when I walk through the valley of the shadow, I will not fear death. I know you're by my side and you'll never leave me by myself. And even when I'm weary, you are calling me to come and rest. Because you cannot be stopped, you have already defeated hell. You cannot be stopped, you have already defeated hell. Hey, I'm dancing on the grave that once held me bound. I'm dancing on the chains that are laying on the ground. I'm dancing out the dark, I'm lighting up the night. Your joy becomes a weapon, and I am here to fight. I'm dancing on the grave that once held me bound. I'm dancing on the chains that are laying on the ground. I'm dancing out the dark, I'm lighting up the night Your joy becomes a weapon, and I am here to fight We're going to do that chorus a couple more times through 
you for what you have done in our lives. I thank you that depression is no match for you. <laughs> I thank you that anxiety is no match for you, God. You're the God of victory. You're the God of salvation, Lord. We declare victory over our families. We declare victory over our bodies. Lord, we pray <laughs> victory over our minds, yes. Lord. Lord, we become obedient to your word. We declare victory over our minds, God. Lord, let's dance in victory. I'm dancing on the grave. I'm dancing on the grave that once held me bound. I'm dancing on the chains that are laying on the ground. I'm dancing out the dark. I'm lighting up the night. Your joy becomes a weapon, and I am here to fight. I'm dancing on the grave that once held me bound. I'm dancing on the chains are laying on the ground. I'm dancing out the dark. I'm lighting up the night. Your joy becomes a weapon. One more time. I'm dancing on the grave that once held me bound. I'm dancing on the chains that are laying on the ground. I'm dancing out the dark. I'm lighting up the night. Your joy becomes a weapon and we are here to fight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done and what you will do, Lord. We believe it, God. We believe it. Amen. Thank you, Lord. in this place of victory because our fight it's not with anything we can see it's happening above us and around us but we're going to stand in the presence of the Lord who goes before us and beside us behind us all around us and he will fight for us we're going to stay in victory
sing this part. And yours is the kingdom. Let's hear you sing it. Let's hear you sing it. Power yours is the glory. Come on. Come on, let's hear you sing it. Come on now. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Come on, I know you got singing. I know you could sing. Kingdom yours. Let's hear you sing it. Come on, just the drums. Yours is. One more time, one more time. Let's hear you sing it. Yours oh, is the glory forever. Amen. Just to give you some insight into what's happening in the atmosphere. So we're a spirit-filled church. We're a kind of church, this is important, that when the presence of God shows up, we acknowledge him. When Anthony steps into the room, I don't just go, hey, Ant. I go, yo, what's going on, Anthony? I embrace him. We have a conversation. I hear about his week. How was your week, Anthony? Now you're trying to be all shy. How was your week, Anthony? It's doing good? Listen, this one, yeah. hey, let me tell you what happened in my week. I had a good week too. When God's presence shows up, we acknowledge him. All right? And because we acknowledge him, we think about what he's done for us, what he means to us, who he is to us, and we get a little bit passionate. Does that make sense, TJ? Sorry, not sorry. So when Creator God shows up in the room, I'm talking about his presence just drops. We stop everything, and we stop everything to our agenda, and we say, God, we know that you are here. And when the presence of God shows up, anything that's filled with darkness begins to break. Anything, anything that's on your life that represents anything but covenant begins to break off of your life. Mindsets thought patterns, addictions, behaviors, strongholds begin to break off of your life. Generational curses begin to break off of your life just by being in the presence of Jesus. So that's why we acknowledge him. And all blessing and honor and power, glory to him. Who sits? Who sits on the throne? Who sits on the throne? All blessing. All blessing and honor, glory, power. Hey, come on, come on. Who sits on the throne? Who sits on the throne? All blessing and honor and glory, power to me. Who sits on the throne? Who sits on the throne? All blessing and honor and glory. You're feeling right now. Acknowledge his presence in the name of Jesus. Who sits on the throne of blessing? Honor, power, power through. That's my Jesus. That's my Jesus. That's my Jesus.
shut up above. Let heaven come. Let heaven come. Let heaven come. Let the kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's my Jesus. Yes, Lord. Jesus. So I see when you turn the light on, the presence of God represents light. When you turn the light on, darkness is dismissed. So whatever the enemy has orchestrated to attach itself to you, I see some of you the enemy has just kind of flung poisonous darts at your process and your life. It's affected your thinking. And today when you're in the presence of God, the healing power of Jesus Christ invades every dark corner of your life every dark corner of your life and if you're visiting with us here for the first time we just want to say welcome welcome into the presence of Jesus this is relationship man this is this is what the presence of Jesus is about it's a, it's a little different than what you're used to probably but nonetheless, this is the presence of Jesus. Let heaven come. Let heaven come. Jesus, we just right now pray for the person next to us. Pray for that person next to you like you'd want somebody to pray for you. Protection in the name of Jesus. An army of angels to surround him, Father. Give him vision, discernment understanding open heart open ears open eyes let him sense the promises that have been assigned to his life God in the name of Jesus amen Come. how many of you right now say pastor Tony I am in desperate need of a miracle in my life I'm in desperate need of a miracle in my life Let heaven come. Let heaven. In the Old Testament, you know how there's many times they received their miracle was by worshiping. Now you could pray, but sometimes things happen when you worship that normally don't happen when you pray. Worship the Spirit of the Lord. Those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. He's here. If you need a desperate miracle, the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord is here. Receive your miracle. Come on. You receive your healing. Receive your salvation. Receive your freedom. Let heaven come. Yes, Lord. Come on. The Bible says, in the Old Testament that the train of his robe you know what a train is right verse says the train of his robe fills the temple so if his train fills the temple imagine what his personhood does it's moments like these can I be honest with you it's moments like these where I feel like man I feel like I, anything's possible right now just because, only because I've been in the presence of God. Now, I, I arrived here today at 8 a.m., okay? These guys showed up at 7.30. When I arrived at 8 a.m., it was just a building they were practicing. I didn't feel what I feel right now. It was just a building with 225 seats. I feel what I feel right now because we brought that worship into this house. The Bible says he inhabits the praises of his people. So wherever people are praising and worshiping God, we get God's attention. So you came in and you placed a demand on the anointing. You placed a demand on the presence of God through your worship and you made it all about Jesus. Yours is the king. Let's hear you sing. Yours. Let's hear, let's hear, let's hear. 
make that make make that almost a declaration yours receive your miracle receive your miracle in the name of Jesus receive that supernatural touch yours is the power yours is the glory and this guy on the congas go ahead walterman let's see what you got let's see what you got yo he's pretty good yeah breathe forever uh pastor anthony i want you to come amen as, as Pastor Tony is talking about the presence of God, it's, we don't have Jesus' physical body here, but we have the Holy Spirit who lives and dwells within us. And as I was reminded of a passage in, in Matthew chapter 17, many of us know the story where Jesus, you know, he performs this miracle and he feeds the 5,000. But the Bible says that they followed him throughout the entire day. And the disciples now turn to Jesus and he says, it's getting dark. This is a remote place, being it's a desert place. He says, let's send the people back home so that they can get something to eat. And so there's a young boy who has a, a, a filet of fish sandwich. Jesus takes that, he multiplies it, and he feeds the 5,000. Now, a lot of times we highlight the fact that the multiplication miracle took place. But here's two things I want you to grab. They were with Jesus. They were in the presence of Jesus, and they had a problem. We could be in the presence of God and still have problems. Does anybody have a problem this morning? Okay, 10 of us, just 10 of us? There was 5,000 people with Jesus, and there was a problem. Now, Jesus didn't respond to the problem just for the sake of responding to it. He responded because they were hungry. If we have a problem and we need God to do something about that problem, there has got to be a hunger inside of us that says, God, I have got to get into your presence. I have got to get where you're at. And I don't know what's gonna take place for the rest of this morning, but if you came here with a problem, you are in the presence of God, this is a good time to present that problem to him. Amen? Because he is the only one, yes. Yes, in fact, if you got a problem, just bring the problem up here. Bring the problem up here. Bring the problem up here. Don't hesitate, don't wait. Bring the problem up here. If you got a problem and we are in the presence of God, we can believe that God will meet that problem simply because you're hungry. Simply because you want that problem met. Keep coming, keep coming. If it's not you, it might be your children. If it's not your children, it might be your cousin. If somebody in your family has a problem, bring that problem to Jesus. Stand in the gap for them. Intercede for them. Keep coming. Keep coming. Bring the problem to Jesus. Bring the problem to Jesus. Bring it, bring it, bring it. I know somebody's sitting there. You're on the edge. You're on the edge. Bring it, bring it. Trust them, trust them. Bring it. Don't wait. Bring it. He met that need. Ironically, it says this. It says they were in a desert place, a remote place. And Jesus says, Here's what we're gonna do. Sit them all in the green grass. How in the world do you find green grass in the desert? With Jesus, it's always green. So your situation might look like a desert situation. There's no water, there's only cactuses. I want you to know that if you bring that problem to him, the grass is greener on his side, amen? Jesus, press in. Now we're gonna play this song no singing. I just want you to pretend that you are in your bedroom, in your own comfort zone, right next to the place, or your living room or your kitchen, wherever it is. And I want you to press into the presence of Jesus. Seek his face. I know you're used to seeking his hand, but seek his face. And I want you to press in to who Jesus is in your life. 
The greatest miracle is not when you receive the miracle. The greatest miracle is what you do in the waiting time. Come on, press in. Go, I release you. Take several moments. Press in. Press in. In the name of Jesus. God, I need you. I need you, God. Lord, I'm overwhelmed. Use your words. Use your words. Let him hear you speak. Let him hear your voice. Jesus. Press it. Come on, don't be distracted. Focus on Jesus. I heard the Lord say this, and hear the prophetic word of the Lord. I heard the Lord say that this is a season and a moment where you can no longer be strong in places that you're supposed to be weak in. The Lord said that this is the moment where I am calling you into a place where you will begin to understand my presence. For the Lord says that this is a moment where I will show you who I am. For I have, for I have declared unto you this day that you are my sons and my daughters and you are ones that will bring forth the truth for the Lord says your gifts are now ready to be primed so that you begin to elevate in a place that God have called you to for the Lord says that this is a moment where I will show you that you are no longer in your past but you have pressed into your future for the Lord says that this is a moment where I will show you who you are in strength for God says that I shall, dwell, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. For God says in this moment, know your body is a true temple. For as it was written in the scriptures, and Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Know this, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Lord says that you must now dwell in this place so that you understand the season that you are entering in for you shall reap in this moment and you shall know who I am for the word of the Lord shall be like a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path and you shall declare the works of God for the Lord says that I am raising you up in this moment to walk in full restoration and healing that you will know what it means to be redeemed says the Lord and you will know what it means to be fully recovered for for God says, do not allow your seasons of past hurts to now enter in a place where you are no longer embracing who I am. For I am your father, says God. And I am your father, says the Lord. And I shall do a new thing inside of you. For this is the hour where you will no longer run to things that are comfortable. For you shall stand on the works and your fruit shall be blossomed. For God says, know them by their fruit. And the Lord says, your fruit shall be evident even in places that you have never been before your light and your fruit shall come forth and people shall ask you what must I do to be saved what must I do to find this Jesus you talk about God says you have become who I have called you to be when it pertains to reconciliation for the Lord God says that now is the time no more delays no more denials no more operations for this is not the season for you to be on delay. For Proverbs 13 and 12 says it like this. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. Many of you have been in a place where your heart has been sickened. But the Lord says, hope deferred maketh the heart sick. But when the desire comes, that desire is the word of the Lord. That desire is the place of Bethel. That desire is Eden. That desire is his presence. In his presence there is fullness. In his presence 
is there's fullness so father in the name of Jesus I decree and declare right now that God you begin to move in this atmosphere that God you will begin to show them that you are Abba that you are Abba Lord that you are the resurrection power God I decree and declare that this day Lord they shall run back to the horns of the altar and they shall allow what's in them to be burnt up for father we decree and declare healing we decree and declare deliverance we decree and declare restoration father in the name of Jesus I pray God that you stir them into a place where they will understand your truth that they will understand your word let a hunger come upon them God let a hunger come upon them God let me know more Jesus let me know more about you Lord let a true hunger come upon them that they run after you Jesus that they run after your presence that they run after your glory that they run after your authority that they run out the altar father in the name of Jesus I decree and declare that this is the season where they shall walk in victory they shall walk in freedom they shall walk in liberty they shall walk in justice I decree and declare that the courts of heaven begin to open up cases that things that have been named upon them no longer are named upon them we decree and declare the courts of heaven be opened up God God I pray that the courts of heaven will establish freedom and liberty you are our judge you are our lawyer you are our father so father we win because you died we win because you rose we win because you spoke it so in the name of Jesus I decree and declare somebody say Jesus I decree and declare that your name is above every name and at the sound somebody say sound at the sound of your name every knee shall bow every tongue shall confess that you are Lord and everybody begin to clap your hands and begin to say thank you Jesus every word that was spoken here this morning landed it was declared over you prophesied over you landed on good soil see because what you've been doing what we've been doing is repeating the same mess we have a narrative we've created a narrative that doesn't match the promise so when something's spoken from the pulpit here prophetically it reverses that narrative it creates a new one this is important we get this because you've been repeating a narrative that doesn't match and celebrate God's blessing on your life. And so when something's prophesied, it's so important that you receive it just like you receive the mail. That's for me. Yeah, that part's for me. I'll take that for me because it cancels out the old narrative and creates a new one. We're skating new, new grooves in the ice, James. We're, we're canceling out the old process and systems that we created. Newness. You are new creatures. The old has passed away. All things have become new. In Jesus' name. All things. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm new. Brother. I'm new. I'm new. Nothing old here. You should have met the old version of me. And for some of you, I'm glad I didn't meet the old version of you. I'm glad I met the new you. Come on. Hallelujah. Oh, the presence of the Lord. There we go. The presence of the Lord. 
Don't dismiss the seed that was planted. Something still had the seed is. Praise God. Hallelujah. Come on now. Where's Leah? Where's Leah? Now's a good time. Listen. Now's a good time. Mom and moms and dads. Listen up. This is your pastor speaking. This is a good time to dismiss your kids. The kids' church, where's Leah? She's coming up. This is a perfect time to dismiss your kids. The kids' church, if they sit here for 36 and a half minutes and listen to me preach, they're not going to have as much fun as they do when they're downstairs. Does that make sense, James? And we, we won't babysit your kids, but what we will do is make sure that they get the word of the Lord. As, even if you have babies. I'm going to step into some territory here. If you have a baby, which you don't, would you let your baby cry in a movie theater? No. Oh, snap. No, not at all. How about, how about a Catholic church? No. You don't even bring babies to Catholic churches. But listen, we minister to, if your baby's one day old, to... And I'll give a shout out oh, for Leah. Snap. She opened up an extra classroom downstairs so that all classrooms Let's give are Leah open a hand. and welcoming children. So people will ask me, does, Pastor, does it distract you when babies cry? I'm like, of course. <laughs> so Leah is the director of our kids' ministry, and Leah is amazing. She, um, uh, first of all, we just make it clear, Leah, we don't babysit kids. Yes, no, we don't babysit yes, no. downstairs. We teach them the gospel. Is your phone? We teach them the love of Jesus. It's Come not on. a place to just... Drop off your kids, you know? That's right. Yeah. That's right. So what are they learning today? So today they are learning about the parable of the persistent widow yeah. and the unjust judge. Mm -hmm. We're going to take that um, parable from the Bible Come and on. create it into games, crafts, and just for a way for them to understand and remember the game. Right. That's good. Now, and we also have a mother's room downstairs. Yes. That, is that TV hooked up yet? I think so. Ah, Yes. So there's a TV, which we need to upgrade. I think it's like a 13-inch from Sears and Roebuck or something like that. 32-inch. Um, but 80-inch. <laughs> we'll put one of these down there. We'll just get to it. So here's the thing. We just want your children to get ministered to at yeah. the level that you're getting ministered to. That's yes. a fact. That's a fact. Yeah. So Leah needs some help. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The apostle speaking up. <laughs> so Leah does a phenomenal job, and she needs help. We need, uh, I think you said it was four or five? Yes, we need at least four to five volunteers that can help out at least once a month. Um, All right. Downstairs in our kids' ministry, we have three classrooms. Mm -hmm. we, have a two, we have a twos and threes classroom. And threes. We just opened a four and five classroom. Got it. We have a six to 12 classroom, and we have the nursery. Got it. Yeah. So um, you, you, that's amazing. That's amazing. And you have a whole team down there. Yes, we have a lot of volunteers, right. but with opening our new classroom, we do need some more volunteers. So you guys know you're my favorite service, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. There's some people here in the first service. I forgot. <laughs> so, yeah, but I know you got outshined the first service. We need four or five, but we do a background check. Yes, we so do. So listen. Don't get, I know m m probably all of us would fail it, right? To, <laughs> but listen, we're not looking. If you carjacked a car 20 years ago, that's you're okay. It's We're looking for some specific stuff that have to do with keeping our kids safe. Yes. Come on, talk about safety. And that's why we've always had this policy that not everybody, just if you're on staff and you're the, the, the part of the team, you can go downstairs. But if you just want to be like walking through, listen, I got to let you know, we, we create a policy because something has happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we have some people that are just not right looking to go downstairs. Yeah. So we want to keep the kids safe. You understand that, right? Come on. Yeah. Yes. Especially if you're a parent. You're like, thank you. And so um, we need four or five people. Yeah. And I and just want to say. Can we just um, get those four or five people? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, say what you can say. Um, if you are a new parent and you're a little nervous about your kid coming downstairs, right. you can come after service once all the kids have left, and I will give you a walkthrough of nice. all the classrooms, oh, just not while the kids are all down there. Yeah, but especially yeah. if you're a new parent. That makes yeah. sense. Because yeah, if I was a new parent, I would be like, oh, I'm going to yeah, drop definitely. my kid off here kind of thing. <laughs> you know, sometimes it takes three or four times to get really comfortable yeah. and stuff like that. So five, five people from this service. Yes. Jesus gave us the message to spread the gospel. He right. told us to spread the good news. And what better way to do that than teaching our future generations? Yeah, go, Leah. 
We need five people. If you're involved in several different ministries, please do not volunteer. Yeah. But if you could, once a month? Yeah, just five once people. a month. You're on camera right we'll now. And we'll, you'll get yes. trained. You're on camera, so don't mess up. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, seven. Beautiful. Beautiful. Don't tell the 9 a.m. <laughs> service, but you guys did better. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So why don't we just dismiss yeah. them with you, right? Yeah, so you guys can come out into the Meet foyer the with back. me. I'll take down your name and numbers and stuff Sounds like that. Good. Thank, Thank you, you so Leah. much, Thank everybody. Thank you. Praise God. Amazing. All right, let's talk about. If I can plug in for Leah, I have a three-year-old downstairs, and there's nothing I love more than on a Sunday morning. Yeah. We get in the car, and she'll tell me what she learned. Right, that's good she'll stuff. show me her art craft. She's not babysitting kids downstairs. She's teaching the next yeah, generation. Yeah, that's good stuff. Which is awesome. I love it. I Come love on. it. Come on. Let's do this announcement first. We have, yes. Because we're an equipping church. In the last several years, we've seen a real uh, drive from you guys to start businesses, small businesses, LLCs, S-Corp, um, sole propriety, 501c3. So we're, we're, we're creating this a part of our Momentum School of Ministry, teaching this course next Saturday. So if you have a, a, an idea to start a small business, attend this course, go on to Momentum Resource Center. Dot com and sign up and yes. make sure you're there with Patricia Jeremy. Yeah, she's very Amazing. knowledgeable. She's helped many people Amazing. in our church start their businesses. So it's awesome. All right. Product. You all have asked and you have received. We have new church merch. So I had three things to show you, but Pastor Tony took one to wear they were like, today. How many times should we put restoration on this shirt? Yeah. So... We did like a, a limited release of uh, yeah. merch so that yep. we could get the feel of what, what you guys like. What does merch mean? What does merch mean, please? Merchandise. Thank you. <laughs> Some people were. Everyone under 50 <laughs> understood what I was saying. <laughs> You're welcome. Oh, Lady Cynthia understood. I was, hel I was helping you. Dottie did not. No. Oh, <laughs> oh you did? So we have the short sleeve t-shirt, which Pastor Tony is wearing. We have a long sleeve, which just on the back says your future is bright. Which the church did not ask me if they can take this. Yes. And then we have a hoodie sweatshirt that says restoration, restoration with Charlie. our logo. What's up? So Beautiful. I got to say, first service went a little crazy selling, and we yep. only have a selected amount. So if you want one of these things, go to the cafe. They're selling after second service. Now, I already know there's going to be people in the room. I only got sizes small to extra large. Oh. I, but let me tell you, what I already had, the homeboys I already had four large. people come up to me. <laughs> I'm doing a pre-sale of sizes bigger because I didn't want to get each Quadruple. size and not know what people want. So it's I already true. have four people that I'm ordering this week their sizes. So if you are larger than extra large and you want something, come see me. And I will put you down for what you want and what your size is. And it will come in like within a week, sense. week and a half. That and children's it, sizes, yes. Sense. I'm definitely going to get some in the 3T for my daughter. So it will be really sense. cute. So come see me if you want a bigger size other than extra large. Please don't see my workers. They are going to look at you like they don't know Where what they're doing. What is going on? They let them do the coffee. But, right? yes. <laughs> so go out, get T-shirts, get sweatshirts, and, yes. Makes sense. That's Thank it. you, Melissa. I um, appreciate you. Yeah, you're Thank you. Else. And we have... Um, was it this sat? We have this Saturday a service, the Edge service. We changed the time of our Saturday night Edge service with Apostle Marcus, and the time is at 5 p.m. Everybody get this. So if five, if Saturday night service is something you're like, you know what? I like doing my laundry on Sunday mornings. I think I'll come Saturday night. Come Saturday night. So it begins. Uh, well, they have a service this coming Saturday. I think that's it, David. That's it. Oh, yo, I got rid of all my. My cards, I have 50 cards that Sarah made, and I got rid of all 50 of them. Pasta with the pastor. I didn't give these two guys here in the front. So can you take a picture of that <laughs> so we don't have to print out more? <laughs> if you did not get this card and you're new to the church, it's an inv I'm inviting you. Next week, you get, a, uh, you get a lunch, a free lunch. Pasta with the pastor. You guys got a card. You guys didn't get a card. You didn't get a card. I'm sorry for pointing. But... Um, that's next service, next week's service, right after service, and uh, we'll, we'll enjoy possible the passing after the second service. That sounds great. Thank you, Jay. You can't, no, you can't go. No. 
you can't go. And then we've had also to move up a, a new believer. I'm excited about yes. this. Yes, yes. Listen, Mike. we ran. We, this God is doing so many amazing things. We ran out of cards because there's so many new faces and families. So can Yo. we just give a Lord a shout hey. for that? So speaking of that. If you have been newly saved within the last six months, what do I mean by being saved? If you have surrendered your life to the Lord within the last mm -hmm. six months and answered an altar call here, we have a class that we are starting up on May 5th. Yes. Sunday, May 5th. It is going to run for seven consecutive Sundays at 9 a.m. in the youth building. And we're going to be hitting truth. Somebody mm -hmm. say truth. Truth. So how many of you in this room know that this world does not, for the most part, follow Truth. That's correct. Truth, biblical truth, that solid truth. So correct. this course is designed specifically if you are newly saved, you have surrendered your life to the Lord, this class yep. is yep. free. You will get a workbook. Come on. You will be taught foundational things that you need to know. So there is no reason for anyone yep. to not be yep. here. Even if you, if you are a seasoned Christian, you say, hey, I'd like I'll to share up my myself, foundations yeah. on this. So we kind of came up with a motto. I, I got to give Sarah... Uh, credit for this one. So if that's you, if you want to take it, then you're going to teach it. So if you're a seasoned Christian that's and good. school of preaching that's graduates, yeah, we are going to be looking Hello. for teachers. So to start up, Apostle Marcus is going to be spearheading this and getting this off, in, uh, off the ground and running. But going forward, it's going to be like seven weeks and then a month off and then Come seven on. weeks. So it doesn't matter when you Praise when God. you hook in. If you hook in in the third week, that's fine. You just yeah. pick up the last, uh, the first couple of weeks the next time we have it around. Mm -hmm. So this is definitely for you if you are new to the faith and you want to know more, you want to be grounded. That QR code, you can That's hit good. that now. If not, you can go online to rcri.app slash essentials. And I'm going to pause because I see people getting their phones out. Yeah, so yeah, it's good. Leave, that, leave that up there for a couple of seconds. But get on board with this. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mike. And while you're at it, do me a favor. Help make me help. Let's help make Jesus famous. Go on to the Facebook page. Restoration Church R.I. and share the sermon onto your personal page. Now. You can do it now. People are like, I know you go on your phone during the service. And I know you're not taking notes because I see you going like this. <clears throat> share that page um, while, you're, while, you, while you're at it. And then register for that class. And then register also. Call the phone number that's uh, on the card that I gave you for pasta with the pastor. Let us know. Text us. 585-6343. Let us know that you're coming and um, that your crew is coming. If they're new, Don't bring your family of 50 people that are coming in from out of town. Um, we've been in those places where we have to emergency order pizza strips from uh, down the street. Yeah, let us know, please. And, um, you know, if you're going to bring in out-of-town family. So everybody take a deep breath. We're going to worship Jesus in our giving. We're going to worship Jesus in our giving. Thank you, Father. Lord, we've declared 2024 as a struggle-free year in our finances, Lord. That when we need something, we're able to purchase those things, Lord, because you are our provider. We are good stewards of our finances, Lord. We are not buying a $9 cup of coffee every day, but we're making our coffee every, at home every day, Lord, because we are stewards of our finances. If somebody just get convicted in Jesus' name, amen. I heard somebody laugh. I'm going to take that. That's a conviction. If that's how you respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, as long as you change. Praise God. Come on. Galatians chapter 4. Um. Today's message is so timely, what's happening in Israel and Iran. Um, super timely. In fact, I skipped over um, Galatians chapter 4, verses 9 through, uh, verses 8 through 20. Um, I had that all prepped and ready to go. In the last two days, I changed it. I skipped over to verses 21 to 31 because it talks about Abraham's two sons. Um, and the title of my message today is Don't Produce an Ishmael. Don't, <laughs> don't produce um, an Ishmael. The timing of it. Let me just give you some insight. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you're dogging Israel, you have to read your Bible. It's important. 
Now, there are some pastors that will just say, pray for Israel and forget about the rest of the Middle East. I say pray for the whole region. We pray for Israel. We pray for Iran. We pray for Iraq. We pray for Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait. Uh, all, all the countries involved, there is a real conflict happening in the Middle East that breaks my heart. But everything must be funneled into this narrative to prepare Jesus, for, to, prepare, to prepare for the return of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Everything. The world is centered on Israel. And times is centered on Israel. So please don't be that person if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, a dog Israel. We pray for the whole entire region. Now, don't pray for peace because it's not going to happen. Why? Because it's the opposite of the narrative that must happen to bring in the end times. You know when peace is going to happen? Peace is going to happen during the Great Tribulation, which we're not going to be here for, which the Antichrist is going to sign a peace agreement with Israel and the Arab nations. That's when peace is going to happen. Okay? And I know what everybody has an idea who the Antichrist is. That person is, it, it doesn't make a difference to us because we're not going to be here during that season. Does that make sense? It's important that we grasp this. But th- let's, let's read the word of the Lord. Paul, the apostle Paul says this. Tell me who, tell me you who want to live under the law. Do you know what the at- law actually says? The scriptures say that Abraham had two sons. One from his slave wife, Hagar. And one from his freeborn wife, Sarai. The son who he produced with Hagar, Ishmael, of the slave wife, was born in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. This is important that we get this. That if we're expecting the promise of God, that there's no human effort involved. Please, if you're praying for a miracle, take your hands off. But the son of the freeborn wife, oh, we're going to get into that in a minute. Uh, I will. Was born as God's own fulfillment of his promise. These two women serve as an illustration of God's two covenants. The first woman, Hagar, represents Mount Sinai where people received the law that enslaved them. And verse 25. And now is Jerusalem is just like Mount Sinai in the Arabia. So we're going to talk about the Muslim countries today. Because she and her children live in slavery to the law. But the other woman, Sarah, represents the heavenly Jerusalem. She is the free woman, and she is our mother. As Isaiah said, rejoice, O childless woman, you who never given birth. Break into a joyful shout, you who have never been in labor. For the desolate woman has more children than the woman who lives with her husband. And you, dear brothers and sisters, are children of promise, just like Isaac. So now, this is interesting, verse 28. This just hit. This is New Testament. This is Paul, New Testament, saying you are children of promise just like Isaac. Because the Bible says we've been grafted in. Now, we don't get rid of Israel, but the church doesn't replace Israel. This is impo- we, we get this now. But you, verse 29, are now being persecuted by those who want to keep the law. Just as Ishmael, the child born by human effort, persecuted Isaac, the child born by the power of the Spirit. But what do the scriptures say about that? Get rid of the slave and her son, for the son of the slave woman will not share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. So, dear brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but we are children of the free woman. What's happening in, in, what's happening in the Middle East is really interesting. This, the, Abraham makes two decisions. He has two children. He has Ishmael and he has Isaac. Ishmael now, to this day, represents, he's the father of the Arabic nations. Who have now become, Ishmael is known, according to historians, Ishmael is known as the ancestor of the prophet Muhammad. And then we have Isaac. So God acknowledges Ishmael, but blesses Isaac. If you consider yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, I would be very, very careful how you deal and how you interact with the international scene right now. Because it looks a mess, but God's in control. Wow. Does that... It, it's a mess. No, it look. It is a mess, but God's in control. He's so powerful, he can work through the mess-ups of the entire world and go, everything's going according to plan. Everything's going according to plan. So you know what I pray? I pray for the salvation of the Jewish people and also the Muslims. 
Because Israel is so important. And I got into this debate where somebody told me Israel is God's favored people. I'm like, you're talking about the Old Testament. The New Testament says we're all God's favorite people now. So the key thing about Israel is thousands of years ago, there's a moment where God gives the nation of Israel a promise that to this day is unfulfilled. Okay, to this very day that's unfulfilled. Thousands of years later, that promise is still in the atmosphere waiting to be fulfilled in the nation of Israel. So for thousands of years, they've been unfulf- living under the power of unfulfilled promises and doing the wrong thing. But guess what? We, the Bible says to pray for Israel, not because they're doing an awesome job, but because there's still things that God has to accomplish in this country. I said that all in one breath. Was that good? <laughs> okay. So yeah, I want to get this straight. Oh, pray for Israel. They're so they're so righteous and holy. Not really. God said, pray for them because, and this is powerful. Thousands of years later, God says, I still got something for Israel. So pray for them that they get it right. Because they've been getting it wrong. All of these years. When we read the remarkable contrast between Abraham's two sons in Genesis chapter 16. Now, let's, let's look. To, I, we, I think we have it from verse 11 on. But I decided I'm just going to read um, a little further. In verse 1 of chapter 16. We can keep that up. It says, now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. This is a story. I would like to see this made into a movie. <laughs> yeah. But she... but. She born, had born him no children. That sounds like hood. You born me no children. <laughs> I'm like, what is kind of English is that? Your mama born you. But she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. This, and this is what she says. James, I realize it was, it was her idea. She says to her husband, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slaves so that we can have children. I just came back from a men's conference. I could go in one direction, but I'd be very, very careful. Hey, that's not nice. (laughs) Who said that? Somebody just said it's her fault. She said to Abraham... This is the messed up part. Abraham agreed. Kind of reminds me of an Adam and Eve scene, but we won't go there. He agrees. You see, when God gives you a promise and you take it in your own hands, you make bad decisions. You never make a good decision outside the plan of God for your life. Never. You're never going to go, I disobeyed God and that kind of worked for me. Have there, has it been, James? <laughs> Angie? <laughs> Anthony? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anthony's like, don't put me in. <laughs> See, when you make decisions, God gives Abraham and Sarah a promise. Now, Abraham is 100 and Sarah is 90. And God says, you're going to have kids. That's disgusting. Bro, like if they were part of this church, if Abraham was part of the men's ministry, and Abraham comes to you and says, God told me that my wife and I are going to have children, the men would go, bro, just take it easy. You're going to hurt yourself. I don't want to visit you in the hospital. But they got a promise from God. They got a promise from God, and because the promise didn't unfold in their timeline, they decided to do things their way. And when you do things your way, I am telling you, the science I'm pretty sure is 100%, but it will never work out. Making a long story short, in verse 4, the Bible says that when Hagar became pregnant, Sarah despised Hagar. So the first thing that's going to happen, you're going to make a bad decision and then despise what you've decided to do. And you're going to live in regrets. And there's times that I could track in my own life that when I lack patience that I've made decisions and outside the plan of God that I live in regret and begin to despise the very thing that I've released. And then she says to Abraham, you are responsible. It's your fault. 
One thing I learned from disobedience, when someone's disobedience, disobedient, they want to blame other people. Don't, don't blame me. I actually want to say, I told you so, but we're not supposed to say that, right? Maybe once in a while you could say it. But it's like she despised the situation, and then she blamed Abraham. This is what happens now. And then in verse 7, the angel of the Lord found Hagar. Hagar was a mess near the, de near the desert. It was a spring that was beside the road of shore. And, and he said to Hagar, the slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, she answered. And then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. I will increase your descendants now. Okay, this is... So Hagar is about to give birth to a son named Ishmael. And God says, I will increase his descendants, the father of the, of the Arabic nations. The angel of the Lord said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael. And from the Lord has heard your misery. And this is part of the prophetic word now. This is part of what the angel of the Lord said to Sarai, to said to Hagar about Ishmael, to the Arabic nation. Then he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him. And he will live in hostility towards his brothers. Who are his brothers? The Jews. The Muslims and the Jews all say Abraham was our father. Abraham was our father. Ishmael will say, Isaac was my brother, and Isaac will say, Ishmael was my brother. And so the key thing about this story is that Abraham and Sarah put themselves in a position to help God. You ever try to help God? In, in your process of waiting, you decide to kind of like sidestep and, and kind of expedite the situation here. But herein lies the tension when you're waiting. When God gives you a promise that doesn't produce in your timeline, I call that a gap. <laughs> I know, nothing fancy. But say gap. I know, it's a revolution. When you're waiting for the promise, and you want to be there, but you're here, there's a gap. See, the real problem isn't that Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90. The real, the, the real problem was that in, in the science world, that is pretty much impossible. That's not the problem. The problem is how you respond during the process. The real crisis is not waiting for the miracle. The real crisis is making sure that you remain steadfast in your faith as you are waiting for the miracle. So the tension here is they put themselves in a position. You can find rest in the promises of God. That's the beautiful part. But the not so beautiful part is where do you, what do you do when I feel like I should be there but I'm here? First service, a lady says, I've been waiting 30 years. If you were to say something like that to God, God would say, he wouldn't say so, but he would say, so? Because <laughs> this sounds kind of be a day is like a thousand years. So if we take one day, she was waiting 30 years, and take 30 years times 356 years, 65, leap year, and take that 365, times it by 30 that's 10,590,000 days for us. A day is like a thousand years. So God is not phased because you've been waiting a long time. Because he's not, last week we learned, he's not moved by chronological, chronos time. He's moved by Kairos time. When an event is ready to happen. I know you want to be there, but you need to be here. Because God says, on your mark, get set. <laughs> that was good. You preached that before, didn't you? <laughs> and that tension that's building, there's somewhere in the Bible that says somewhere when you wait on the Lord, you'll get strength. I don't know, somewhere in the Bible. So God wants you exactly. See, the breakthrough is not receiving. The breakthrough is what you do in the process of receiving. There's the circumstances that where we have no control over, but you do have control over your environment. Your environment is while you're waiting for the promise and you are here, it's not what happens to you. It's what you do and think what, while you're waiting what happens to you. So you can't control your circumstances, but you can control your environment. Your circumstances often are as a result of your own disobedience. Your circumstances, Ishmael is not part of the picture. You produce 
something that years later the nation of Israel is still dealing with. So then, I mean, we see this. This is how we have to grasp this now. Abraham made a decision to sleep with an Egyptian woman, produce an heir that would be the father of the Arabic nations. And now to this day, they are suffering the consequence of that one decision thousands of years later. Still suffering. The, 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 watch out because in your process of waiting, if you produce an Ishmael, it's, that decision is going to affect your children. And your children's children. And your children's children. And, and so on. And but when we read this scripture here, Abraham produced a son who became the problem and the father of the Arabic nations. When God gives you a promise, make sure you don't produce a problem. When God gives you a promise, make sure you don't produce a problem. Because it creates circumstances. You know, oftentimes we, we, we produce circumstances that we pray for. And we say, just help me in this situation. That if we properly stewarded the environment that God was setting up for us, we wouldn't produce these circumstances as a result of disobedience. God made it clear. I'm responsible for my environment by how I think. Paul says you will become what you think. You control your thoughts. Some of you, you wake up in the morning, in the first 30 seconds, you're like, how about the last three weeks with that rain? Oh, I can't take it. I hate it. I hate my job. And then you pray for God's blessing. <laughs> Whatever you speak will come visit you. You've got to be careful, ladies and gentlemen. I can't, I can't control my son, but you know what? I can control my environment, but what I think and what I produce for my lips. So Abraham and Sarah now, because they were not discerning while waiting, they produce a promise. Don't make the problem the crisis. What was the problem? Well, the problem was that Abraham and Sarah could not have children. But the real crisis is not the problem. The real crisis is to make sure that your faith gets us to where we need to be. And Abraham's crisis was that he was impatient and produced an heir marked by conflict. Make sure that your decisions don't go diabolically opposed to the plan of God for your life. If you've been waiting 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, God says, be still and know that I am God. The tension, the impossible waiting goes completely against logic. And it's, it's, it's funny to me that the Bible itself in Romans chapter 4, the Bible itself now uh, highlights and accentuates, this is bad. This is really impossible. This is what Romans 4 says. Without weakening in his faith, he faced, Abraham faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. All right, calm down, Romans, since he was 100 years old. And that Sarah's womb was also dead. So this was the fact. The Bible itself raises up and elevates the fact that yeah, that's really, really impossible. The evidence goes completely against what God told you. God gave you a word, and when you look, you're like, what I see and what I believe does not match up. What God told me was going to happen, and, what I, and, and what's happening right now does not line up. And this is why the Apostle Paul says, we don't live by the seen, we live by the unseen. And this is where Abraham and Sarah are at. God reminds them now, 13 years later, uh, after the birth of Ishmael, in Genesis chapter 17. Let's pu pull that up. It says now, then Abraham, then God said to Abraham, regarding Sarai, your wife, her name will no longer be Sarai, but from now on her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and give you a son from her. Remember, I told you this same promise a couple of years ago, 13, 14 years ago. I gave you that same, remember that promise he says to Abraham? Abraham's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to give you the promise again because he loves to remind you. I will bless her and give you a son from her. Yes, I will bless her richly and she will become the mother of many nations, kings of nations, in fact, to be among her descendants. Then Abraham bowed down to the ground. He laughed to himself in disbelief. How could I become a father at the age of 100, he thought. And how can Sarah have a baby when she is 90 years old? Abraham said to God. May, so this is, what God, this is what Abraham says, which I'm kind of just messed up with this part. It, it's like, may Ishmael live under your special blessing? I know I made a bad decision. 
I kind of like, I prayed for a miracle, but I did something on the side that wasn't, it's like, it's like sometimes people will come to me and say, Pastor Tony, I made a decision. Can you just bless me now? And I'm like, no, that's not a blessed decision you've made. Did you inquire of the Lord? Did you get counsel of the Lord? See, one of the things that I, I teach that when you're ready to make a bad decision, you're ready to make a bad decision when you haven't inquired of the Lord. That's kind of the most obvious, right? Another thing is if you haven't inquired counsel of people that you've surrounded yourself with, with wisdom. With a, with a multitude of counsel, there is wisdom. So when I'm about to make a major decision, I don't just put my blindfolds on and just jump in. I make sure that it's bathed in prayer and that I seek counsel for it. So, but this is a time that there, no counsel was sought, that Abraham wants to say, I already have a, you made me a promise that I would have a son. I have a son. Can you just bless him? There are things that you've done, decisions that you've made that are not qualified for a blessing. But the beautiful thing about this is that in the process of restoration, in the process of restoration seven times, God says, I'm going can to cancel the years the canker worm has eaten and I will bless you and your family. So if you've produced an Ishmael, I got to tell you that God can redeem you from those bad decisions. He can cancel out the consequences of your bad decisions. All you have to do is open up your heart to the Lord. He says, can you bless him? But God replied, no. Did you know no is a full sentence? Hey, you want to go out to drinks with us on Friday night? No. Yo, we're going to go out clubbing in Boston. No. Yo, come out, man, with the fellas. We're going to smoke. No. Oh, man, I need to preach. A, I could see I got to preach a message on that. Everybody say no. Okay, that's another talk show. She says, God said, no. Sarah, your wife, will give birth to you. To you a son and you will uh, and, and I will confirm my covenant his name will be Isaac do you realize in Genesis chapter 22 remember when God told Abraham to bring Isaac up to the mount to the mountain you realize the exact language was take your only son what about Ishmael God likes to block the entrance to your past Listen, if you have kids out there, you should pay support, child support. <laughs> I'm not saying. Come on now. And the ladies of the house say amen. amen. And the men of the house say amen. amen. He said, take your own. He didn't even acknowledge. Sure. Woo. How many of you made, you know what the reason made a bad decision? God doesn't want to acknowledge it anymore. Yes, he says, I remove your sin as far as the east is from the west. Why east and west? Because there's no east pole or west pole. There's a north pole and a south pole. The south pole is where the penguins are. The north pole is where Santa lives. There's a measurable distance. <laughs> there's no measurable distance between east and west. He says, I, I will. I will. I will remove your sin as far as the east is from the west. And then he says, I am making a choice to forget them. He didn't, say, he didn't say, I'm forgetting them. He says, I'm making a choice. See, you forget as a product of your humanity. He forgets as a product of his divinity. He says, I'm making a choice to remember your sin. To forget your sin no more. He can count the hairs on your head, but I'll forget your sin. He says, take your only Son, I'll acknowledge Ishmael, I'll bless him, but I'll give the covenant to Isaac. To Isaac. So if you produce an Ishmael, God's like, Ishmael? Now, the beautiful part of this is that we pray for Israel, we pray for the Muslims. Please don't dog the Muslims. Please don't dog Israel, don't dog the Muslims. Pray for the whole region. Pray for salvation. And the Arabic nations, we support missionaries in certain parts of um, the Muslim countries. And that we, we don't even advertise it. Because if they knew that they were missionaries, they would be killed. And there was a gentleman there 
um, TikTok, right? You could put up a video. There's a certain option. Snapchat, you could put up a video there for 24 hours and it disappears. So there was a man there, a Muslim man. He gets saved. He puts on a full gear so he's unrecognizable. And he preaches the gospel for a minute at a time, 59 seconds. That gospel is flooding through all the Arabic nations. 24 hours later, they can't detect them. It just gets erased into the cloud. The nations, the Muslim nations need Jesus. And if you produce a decision that is anti-covenant, God says, you know who has a good memory? You. <laughs> Me. We want to fish it out. And we deal with shame. Shame causes us to self-assess without the power of the blood. Shame gives us a graceless perspective of who we are. Shame gives us a perspective that Jesus has not died on the cross. And so God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son. So this is some principles here that we can learn from this story. First principle is God, this is simple, doesn't need your help. Just your obedience. You'll, when you're in the process of obeying God, there's always reward at the end. There's always reward at the end. How can you pray for a supernatural event in your life and then place your natural hands on the task? And this is why Abraham was saying, can you bless Ishmael? It's so much easier. I don't want my 90-year-old wife to go through labor pains. Just bless Ishmael. I know it doesn't make sense, but not only will God never ask anything from you that's easy, but he will often ask things from you that just don't make sense. Can you bless Ishmael? In your waiting season, please, just promise me, don't spend time with Hagar. Because some of you are looking at options. Oh. <laughs> got to look at my, I got to look at my options, you know, because it's been a long time. What's a long time? Five days. I've been praying for a breakthrough for five days. Whatever it's five days or 30 years, you're looking right now, you're looking at options. And you're considering the different Hagar's that you can hang out with to produce a seed that will be in danger of canceling out covenant in your life. But covenant cannot be canceled. Because we look at Israel where God says, I still made a promise, so just pray that you get it. Make sure the only reason why Israel is not being destroyed is God said, don't destroy them. I have a promise for them. Make sure if you're waiting for a promise, you're walking in favor. I don't want to be Israel where like, yeah, you're still alive because God is keeping the missiles from hitting you because he's got some unfulfilled stuff in your life. I want promises to be fulfilled in my life because I'm walking in favor. The favor of the Lord, his mercy, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. So God doesn't need your help. He wants your obedience. And it, it works best when you say yes. Yes is a full sentence. Everybody say yes. yes. When you say yes to the Lord, I know you've said no to the Lord, but one yes can cancel out 10,000 no's in a heartbeat just like that. Come on now. Come on. Hallelujah. Woo, he don't need your help, Pastor West, right? You know that. But every once in a while, you're like, I got a good idea. Good ideas can produce Ishmael's too. I mean, did the end result get accomplished? Abraham got a son. It got accomplished, but it wasn't a miracle. It wasn't supernatural. Number two, this is interesting, and I'm going to explain this. Face the facts, but acknowledge the truth. Romans 4.19, we're going to go back to that verse. Without the weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. This is the writer of Romans. He faced the fact but acknowledge the truth. The fact is, you're too old to have a child. The truth is, God gave me a promise. Have you ever received news from a doctor and it just takes the breath away from you? And you're like, <gasps> that's a fact. We took your blood work and you have this. There's no, there's no, if it's scientific, we'll do the blood work. We took blood from your arm. And the fact is, this is what you've been diagnosed with. That's the fact. 
face the facts, but I'm going to acknowledge the truth. And the truth says that he can heal my body. And the truth says by his stripes, I'm healed. The fact is, you're broke. <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing. I remember back when we, <laughs> I'm going to go to that story. When we lived in Missouri, we, we had a bit, we had, uh, uh, I wasn't working, I was in school, and we just struggled there, and, and, and we, then we had a baby, and we were in the hospital, we're like, how are we going to pay off for this? And a lady came in, and she says, hey, do you, do you have state aid? I was like, no, I don't. And we kind of felt bad about going on to welfare at the time. That's what they called it. And back then, they had coupons, <laughs> the food stamps. <laughs> J- judge me all you want. And my mom, my dad, my in-laws were like, listen, you paid into that. We paid into that. You take it. So I remember, I used to send, I used to send my wife to the store with the food stamps. I'd be like this. <laughs> now it's an EBT card. Now you can, it looks like a debit card. We're like buying shrimp and lobster. <laughs> can we buy a car with this? No. Okay, Focus. The fact is, you're broke. The truth is, God is my provider. He's Jehovah Jireh. The fact is, you're broke. The truth is, stop spending so much money on that caramel macchiato with sugar and flipped cream and caramel all drizzled all over it. Caramel, yeah. I always, I always order a grande americano. I'm like, I'm right here. Get it? Grande americano? Never mind. Thank you, Greg. (laughs) It's focus. So the truth is, the fact is, what you see. The fact is, Abraham, Sarah, don't do it. The truth is, I got a word. Now remember now, but actually, let's let's make this clear. Up until this point, Abraham did not receive any kind of supernatural miracle. All he had was what? A word. A word given to him several times. He did not receive a miracle. But if you're facing the facts, you got to make sure that the truth is speaking louder than the facts. How do we do that? Get into the word of God. The fact is you are struggling in your finances and you have three or four or five jobs. But the thing is if you're trying to produce an Ishmael through your finances by getting another job, all you're going to do is produce frustration. Yeah, you're making bills, you're making the end, you're making ends meet. But you're not receiving the revelation of who Jehovah Jireh is. Face the facts, but acknowledge the truth. How do you encourage yourself in the truth? You get into the word. The truth will always outshine the facts. The truth will always outlast the facts. The truth will always outrun the facts. And what happens when the facts seem bigger than the truth? I mean, it says here, Abraham came face to face with reality. It doesn't mean... That your faith ignores reality. It just means that you are walking by faith. And the last point is don't allow your faith to weaken during this season. Your faith, I want to make the, your faith is not an emotion. I feel like my faith is all over the place. No, faith don't do that. Every, the Bible says that to each of us has given a measure of faith. And with that measure of faith, that measure of faith is enough for you to experience what you need to experience. But oftentimes we think the breakthrough comes when the answer comes. No, the real breakthrough comes is when you just get through it without making Ishmael decisions. It's without falling and staying down. I'm either up or getting up. I'm never down. Don't quit. Don't allow your faith to stumble. Your faith is not a roller coaster. Your faith is consistent. Never give up. You've been waiting 30 years. Continue to wait. That might be, I'm telling you, God, God is holding off on the promise. Mate, that might be the only thing keeping you saved. That might be the only thing that's keeping you sane. The fact that you're relying on the Lord. Talking about the nation of Israel. The only thing that kept them close to the heart of God was having enemies. The only thing that kept them close to God was being attacked. And he said, listen, I'm going to bring you through a season of refreshing. Don't forget. Because it seems, man, when we have an extra couple of bucks in there, 
We forget about praying for, for, for deliverance and for freedom. And I'm stuck on the financial part of it. Some of you are praying for miracles. Make sure you're a good steward. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm going to push this now with you. I'm going to switch and turn into a financial coach. <laughs> Reach for that Folgers in your cab cabinet and make the coffee at home. Does that make sense? Yeah. I will. Make yourself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and bring it to work. No tuna fish. No, no eggs and tuna. Egg and tuna sandwich. Bro, why did you bring that up for, man? You triggered me. <laughs> Be sound in your finances, man. If you're struggling in your finances, say this. We don't need that. Say it out loud. We don't need that. And that's an Ishmael, actually, when you continue to spend and when you go into debt. You spend. You can use a credit card. I will pay it off at the end of the month. That's an Ishmael. Your undisciplined credit card use is, is an Ishmael. Woo. All right. Gambling online. I'm going there. Is an is an Ishmael. Um, make sure that your your wife knows your code to your phone. This is not in my notes. I'm just kind of the gambling part. There's someone here. You created an Ishmael by gambling. You have an addiction to gambling, and you frequent and you frequent these gambling places, hoping to make it back. That's Ishmael. The consequence that you've released in your lineage is a curse. And God wants to bring deliverance. God wants to heal your body. He wants to heal your mind. You are as sick as your secrets. And God wants to take away your secrets so you're not sick anymore. God wants to heal you. No more Ishmaels in Jesus' name. Faith. Faith is not tied to an outcome. Faith is tied to a person. So there's not really about an outcome. We think the miracle is the outcome. The real miracle is the fact that I'm still saved walking through this. Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. The real miracle is I'm not afraid. The real miracle is you see me here next Sunday. The real miracle, and for some of you, the real miracle is a week from now you're still saved. That's the real miracle. And that's the real breakthrough is that you get through. And that you're not breaking down. But back to the gambling part. I'm sensing that strong finances and gambling. God wants to help you and he wants to heal you. You've created Ishmael's. You want to work. You've, you've gone over the options in your mind. Well, if I could do this. Well, I'm not working from, I'm home at 7. Um, I could get something from 8 to midnight. And then um, we'll do something. On, I can Uber. Some of you, Ubering completely, completely okay. Right? But if you're looking for that as your Isaac is going to really be an Ishmael. Whew. I remember that during, um, when we first got here, we had uh, Zoe and then Samantha. And then my wife couldn't work for some time. Um, so I was like, all right. And I, I never told anybody this. Nobody here knows. They're going to know now. <laughs> At home. I was like, I'll just Uber at night and weekends. I was like, my biggest fear was like, I would pick up somebody from church. <laughs> but you know, hey, you know, I'm not afraid to work. I can go to do something on the side. I would make, and then it turned into people asking me, so you do this for full time? I'm like, oh, no. Oh, okay, so you have another job? <sighs> yeah. Please don't ask me what I do. <laughs> Please don't ask me what I do. Oh, so what are you doing your other job? I'm a motivational speaker. <laughs> Which, I didn't lie, did I? Then the Lord convicted me. <laughs> to 
God, man. Stop throwing my words at me. So I have to witness to people, tell people about Jesus. And I did that for three years. But I was like, and then the Lord convicted me. I was like, Lord, okay, now I feel like I got to do this because I have opportunity. I don't want to see this as my source. It's a resource. You're my source. This was my resource. A resource, the only two difference between those two words is re. Doing it again. Source, resource. But I want to make sure the resource is not coming from a ground that's cursed. I want to come, I want to make sure the resource is coming from a ground that's blessed. So when you work, you don't work to make ends meet. You work as a divine expression of who you are in Christ. Oh, how's work? It's a job. It makes the, pays the bills. No, that's a bad attitude because that's an Ishmael attitude. Ishmael is under the law. Ishmael didn't have covenant. When you have covenant, you're like, powerful. My job is powerful. Because I see God move every day in my workplace. That's work. That's the difference between the Old Testament and the book of Genesis of tending the garden versus the curse, working the land. I'm tending the garden. It's provided for. I'm just taking care of something that was given to me rather than try to pull something out of the ground that's cursed. Don't allow your faith to be weakened. Back to the gambling part. Ooh, finances and gambling. Let me tell you, man. First thing you need to do is confess. Confess to the Lord and confess to either your spouse, your mentoring partner, your coach, whoever's discipling you. Confess. Be free. I have a solution for you. You ready to hear it? If that's you, take that money that you're about to gamble and send it to Cash App to the church. As a donation, give it to missions so we can reach the lost. You know what? You know how the devil will lay, lay off you? If you send over 100 bucks to missions to reach the lost, the devil's about, ah, man, every time I tempt them, they give money to the lost. Every time, I, every time I tempt them to go back onto that app to play, um, um, I don't know, what it, bingo, whatever, whatever's out there. <laughs> They end up giving something to somebody to learn about Jesus. Do that. Do that. Breaking it out into the open. When it's a secret, that's when it festers. When it's out in the open, that's when it heals. So tonight, today, this afternoon, if you produce an if you produce an Ishmael, or you're about to, you're going down a list of options. I'm going to tell you, I have a word from the Lord for you. Stop. Hallelujah. Stop. God says, I love you with an everlasting love. And he's redeeming you. He's bringing you back. He says, come back home, my son. Come back home, my daughter. I love you. With grace and mercy. Don't approach this with shame or guilt. This is a shame-free zone. This is a guilt-free zone. This is a judgment-free zone. This is about his grace and his mercy on your life. So as we sing this song, enter into the Lord's presence, I, I want you to find a spot. Whether it's here here or here find the spot with the presence of the Lord and say God simple starts like this God just forgive me and start a clean slate but before we do this I want to make sure everyone here has a relationship with Jesus Christ if you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ that means he's coming back and he wants to wrap to the church to spend with him eternity in heaven if you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I want everyone here to say this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Clean my heart. I need you as my Lord and Savior. Take away my shame and my guilt. I surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time to accept Jesus, I want you to just raise your hand. You prayed that prayer for the first time, where, wherever you're at. I see you in the back. So I see you. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody on my right? I'm coming back this way here. Anybody? Anybody else? Everybody else has a relationship with Jesus Christ? Can you guys do me a favor? Anthony, right? 
Ah, Anthony, bring up your wife. Come on. I want to pray for you. I want to pray. Bring up your child. Anthony. Noel. Anybody else that prayed that prayer for the first time? That means everybody on this side has a relationship with Jesus? Yes? Yes? And anybody at home, if you prayed that prayer for the first time and you're accepting Jesus into your life, I want you to just type in your information and message us. Actually, send a message to the text, uh, to the church cell phone, 585-6343, and let us know your name, that you've accepted Christ, and we'll connect with you. We'll send you some information to learn more about Jesus. What's your name again? Adiel. Adiana, Anthony, nice to meet you. What's her name? Isla. Isla? This is the best. This is your first time here. Huh? <laughs> first time here. I love it. I love it. This is the best decision, the most important decision, Anthony, that you will ever make for you and your family, for your daughter. And life is going to be very, very different for you guys from here on forth. This is Noel. This is Pastor Jessica. They're going to pray with you guys. All right? Can we give Jesus a hand? Come on now. Everybody here say, no Ishmael. But do this. No Ishmael. No Ishmael. At all. Bro, turn to your neighbor. Please don't produce an Ishmael. And if you're going to do Uber, make sure it's God-inspired with God ordained opportunities and moments in Jesus name your future is bright <laughs>